The Tang class is one that I've covered extensively and exhaustively on my channel, and it's also one of the most discussed archetypes in the game, usually in a controversial way. Time after time, they've been the target of the player base's outrage for being unpleasantly tedious to fight, supposedly taking no skill to play correctly, and resulting in a lot of metas that were, how to put it, less than pleasant. It's also gone through a surprising number of changes over the years. Several members of his roster have undergone a ton of changes to firmly differentiate them from one another. Back in the day, most tanks used to be quite similar, giant bodies of health and durability with some damage and crowd control thrown into the mix. In an attempt to make the class more appealing, Riot spared no effort in rounding out every tank's design, and to their credit, they've done a bang-up job doing so. Conceptualizing a lot of different ways to be a meat shield for your team is no easy task. Overall, the updates have been a net positive for the game, but a consequence of this modernization was the gradual decline of a class that I will unofficially label as Battle Tanks. That's partly why I intentionally went with Maokai Soul Splash Art in the thumbnail of the video, since he's one of the biggest examples of this taking place. Spoiler alert, I do plan on making a retrospective on him in the near future. But anyways, today we'll be going over the downfall of Battle Tanks in League of Legends, what happened to them, and why are they being phased out. To some of you, this may come across as confusing. What do I mean by downfall? Tanks deal crazy amounts of damage to the point where they can even overpower classes that are supposed to beat them like marksmen and skirmishes. If anything, following the durability update, tanks have never been stronger, and they've continuously benefited from systems changes like the mythic item system and whatnot. So let's start there. When I say battle, I'm not necessarily referring to a class or damage output, rather a playstyle. Tanks are divided into two categories, vanguards and wardens. Vanguards, true to their names, are the first ones into a fight. They boast deceptively good combat mobility, especially for this size, and stature while having wide covering range in their crowd control and disruption. The main goal of a vanguard is to basically disorient the enemy team to allow their allies an easy way into a fight. As such, they're considered the more offensive of the two. Wardens are less concerned with inflicting as much pressure on the enemy team and more focused on preventing the enemy team from doing the same to them. Their range of protective, disengaged type abilities buy their teammates time and safety to collect themselves and launch appropriate countermeasures. In addition, their varied forms of protection are often situationally applicable in that they're best used against a specific type of champion or scenario. Due to this, they're labeled as the more defensive of the two. Regardless of which side they're on, tanks are infamous for dealing a good amount of damage if given ample enough time. On the vanguard side, you have no shortage of offenders. Everyone on the list has at one point or another been complained about for seemingly being able to outdamage even carries while being near indestructible. I think we can all attest to that. Orin, Malphite, Zack, Mumu, Sichuani, Maokai, these guys have no business doing that much damage. But this is an endemic to just vanguards. While comparatively smaller in roster size, wardens carry the same notoriety for dealing almost unfair amounts of damage. Shen, Poppy, and Galio don't give off the impression of being defensive champions. It feels like they're better at beating the living daylights out of you. Meanwhile, Tom Kench was once among many people's list of most hated champions in the game for quite some time. And let's not forget the new elephant in the room, Kasante, who shreds you to pieces while having thousands of health, armor, and magic assist. The cause of tanks dealing a lot of damage is elucidated in my video on the class as a whole, but in case you want a short answer, tank busting sources have become more and more plentiful ever since the tank meta of seasons 5 through 7. It's no coincidence that the number of champions and reworks that came out from 2017 onwards with true damage, armor shred, percent health damage, or all of the above has risen exponentially. Not only that, but there are more universal forms of tank busting too. Items, runes, even things like Elder Dragon's burn damage and execute. To combat this, tanks have also been given a lot more damage out of consideration that they won't survive as long as they used to, and therefore not be able to go through as many rotations of their abilities. If you want to know more about that, be sure to watch the tanks video. Back on topic, what separates a battle tank from a conventional vanguard or warden is whether or not their abilities are explicitly designed for combat. Just because a tank deals a lot of damage doesn't necessarily mean their job is to deal damage. Call it a byproduct. Battle tanks are exactly that though. Their job is to deal damage, which often leads to them being misunderstood as juggernauts who ostensibly have comparable resilience to tanks but a greater emphasis on ass whooping. Take Malphite for example, he's a very straightforward champion, lots of armor, can channel some of that armor into damage, and has a one-stop shop engage ability in the form of his ultimate. While one can argue Malphite's more damage oriented than the likes of Alistar, his purpose in a teamfight is to engage and inhibit, using unstoppable onslaught to charge at the enemy backline, seismic shard to bog down their movement, and then ground slam to cripple their attack speed. In recent years, they bumped up his damage by a noteworthy amount, which is why he feels like he doesn't need to rely on teammates to follow up, he can just do the job on his own. But conceptually, I wouldn't call him a battle tank. With that said, who would be considered a battle tank? I would say a battle tank is someone whose pressure is concentrated on fighting as much as possible, as often as possible. Someone not known for their engage or protective faculty, or in other words, their function is to be a raid boss, hence why they're often mistaken as juggernauts. We'll be splitting hairs all the live long day at this rate, so let's just get to the list. Based on that definition, we have Maokai, specifically the old one, Scion, and Shogun, the three champions on the thumbnail. That's all there is. 
The archetype has been downsized tremendously over the years, with many of its former members either getting reworked or changed around to be more something else. That's actually why I wanted to include old Maokai because the current one is not a battle tank anymore. Realistically, you can even make a case that Cho'Goth and Scion aren't even tanks anymore. Cho'Goth for the most part goes full AP while Scion behaves more like a juggernaut instead of a tank. But given that they both still have a tendency to build full defense and still meet the overall criteria for this kind of archetype, that's why they're here. Also, before you ask why is Mundo not included, that's because Mundo is a juggernaut, not a tank. He just happens to build full tank because it's conducive for him. He doesn't have any tank properties other than being tanky, by that logic Darius is also a tank. Anyways, let's go through each of these in more detail. Cho'Goth bears the traits of a tank in the form of area control and disruption. Rupture is a fantastic tool and one of the most underrated abilities in the game in my opinion. A ranged AoE knockup on a 6 second cooldown that heavily slows enemies for a second and change after. He also has Feral Scream, a 2 second silence and a wide cone in front of him. These two abilities combined give Cho'Goth some of the best area disruption in the game and while the utility is great, the damage is even better. Cho'Goth has terrifying damage output even if you don't build AP. Vorable Spike steals AoE damage that slows all enemies caught with percent max health damage attached to it that gets even stronger with every stack of Feast. If you have 10 stacks in the late game, you're staring down 24% max health damage per use of E. Serious business. And of course, Feast. Pick a target, press ultimate, they take true damage. Simple but effective. If not for the crowd control and area coverage, Cho'Goth would in fact be a juggernaut or a mage, but thanks to a strange assortment of abilities, you can't really label him as a tank, mage, or fighter, which is why he's a specialist. In practice though, Cho'Goth builds mainly tank, occasionally running AP items on the side. Playstyle-wise, his skills can be used both offensively and defensively, but generally he's more feared for being a threat to your life than stopping you from doing anything. Scion's depicted as a vanguard in the sense that his ultimate is technically a really powerful engage tool, but among the long distance charge type abilities, I think I speak for most people when I say this one is by far the least practical. It is incredible power, but no control whatsoever. Most players would rather have Ramus, Nunu, or even Kled's ultimates, which aren't as impactful but more generous in targeting or maneuverability. That said, even at point blank range, Scion's unstoppable onslaught is fantastic, almost an immediate cast with crowd control immunity. So you can use it in many ways, cancelling enemy channels, using it to stop dashes, you can even use it to get yourself out of certain crowd control if timed correctly. Mordekai is one of Sion's hardest matchups, but one thing he has going for him is that if you cast ultimate while Mord is pointing at you with death roll, you can cancel the entire thing altogether. Baus may disagree with me, but I actually find Sion's ultimate to be way better as a combat ability rather than its intended purpose of long distance engage. Secondly, Sion's four abilities are all very combat oriented, but not really meant for engage or appeal. Decimating Smash has some of the largest area coverage and longest crowd control in the game, but it's not something you count on for lockdown. Sion is considered a vanguard by the wiki, but he doesn't depend on crowd control for pressure, he's got plenty of base damage, and like Cho'Goth, more people are scared of him because he can actually kill you, not because he can stun you. Finally, Old Maokai. Old Maokai was THE battle tank. Passive granted him some of the best in-combat sustain known to man. In teamfights, he effectively regenerated with every single auto since abilities were being thrown around left and right. His Q is a damaging ability attached to a knockback and slow. Twisted Advance used to do percent health damage and had a longer root duration than the current one. W combined with Q gave him incredible stick potential. You might think with this W being a dash and root that counts as engage, but it has a cast range of only 525 and it was a target dash, so he can't extend its range with flash or anything. Plus, the untarget ability during the dash can be timed to avoid enemy attacks quite well, so in that regard it was more appropriate for combat. The old sapling toss still did have the warding and vision aspects to it, but it used to deal damage on landing and explosion and wasn't dependent on bushes or the bigger damage, making it more practical for fighting than area control. And last but certainly not least, Vengeful Maelstrom, reducing all non-turret damage to himself and his teammates, storing a portion of that damage and detonating the vortex to deal that stored damage to all nearby enemies. You couldn't come up with a better ultimate for a battle tank than this one, and I miss it to this day. In essence, the main objective of a battle tank is to fight, not engage, not disengage. While they still have crowd control and disruption, they tend to have a bit more damage than your average tank, at the cost of being unable to reliably engage on the enemy team. But at times, that may not be a bad thing. I remember when Starhorn Royal Club fought against Samsung White, I believe it was Game 3, Kolo and Rod of Ages first item on Maokai to give him a bit more damage in fights, because Insect went Ramus, who was the main tank for the team, so Kolo could focus on dealing damage. Royal Club didn't pick Maokai for engage or crowd control, that was the job of Insect and Zero. Maokai's job in that case was to buff up his team in Vengeful Maelstrom and go to town in fights, and it was very effective. So if battle tanks have proven in the past they are forced to be reckoned with, why have all of them basically disappeared? Well, that's the very reason, they were too good. People incessantly complain about tanks being impossible to kill and dealing too much damage. Battle tanks are literally the living embodiment of I'm invincible and I can kill you too. 
It still happens today. Even though many battle tanks have been reworked or changed, the question of how much damage a tank should have is still hotly debated on. Riot has spent the past decade trying to push tanks out of the realm of fighting and more into actual tank functions like being durable, teamfight engage, and locking down enemy targets. They still need a modicum of damage just to, you know, fend for themselves, but they try to avoid conventional damage. For instance, Tom Kench was a big problem because he used to be a battle tank. In Quiet Taste would give him crazy amounts of damage by building health, Tongue Lash gave him a low cost low cooldown neutral poke tool, and back when Devourer and Regurgitate were on his W, it used to do like 35% max health damage of rank 5 at one point. He beat tanks, skirmishers, fighters, everyone up in top lane. This was all set by him being one of the worst champions in the mid to late game, but no one, I repeat, no one could beat him 1v1 in laning phase. Nautilus was another big one. Him being pushed to a full-time support was a result of them guiding his base damage to high heaven. Take Riptide as main damage. In 5.13 it got nerfed, then again in 6.5, then again in 7.8. In exchange, his crowd control abilities were made a lot stronger. Depth Charge got massively buffed in 6.16, then again in 7.15, while in that same patch his Q got a lower cooldown, a lower mana cost and mana refund on 7.18, a lower cooldown again on 8.8, .8, and his passive got buffed in 9.6 and 9.8. Battle tanks as a class are innately flawed. You shouldn't simultaneously be tanky and deal a lot of damage. I know this sounds contradictory given that it feels like tanks do more damage now than they ever have, but remember those are two separate things. Battle tanks got phased out of the game because the idea of tanks doing a lot of damage at the time was a problem, but then later on they got more damage as an answer to tank busting capabilities being more accessible. One more reason behind their loss of presence was the absence of distinct playstyles. At the start of the video, I mentioned how a lot of work was put into modernizing the tank roster and making each one stand out from each other. Back in the day, tanks were in some ways too similar. For example, Sejuani and Gragas were compared to each other a lot. Both had a free target dash that stopped and knocked back the first enemy hit. Only Sejuani could dash through minions at the cost of only knocking up one target, while Gragas couldn't dash through minions but could knock back multiple targets. They both had an auto attack enhancement in the form of W, and they both had a long range AoE crowd control projectile. Granted, they were still distinguishable, but there was a ton of overlap. Additionally, tanks were interchangeable back in the day. You may recall Nautilus and Makai being top laners before the former became almost exclusively a support and the latter turned into a jungle support hybrid. The variety in selection was good, but there just wasn't that much personality behind each champion. You could replace Makai with Gragas, with Nautilus, with Sichuani, with Shen. It was as simple as rolling a die and choosing someone based on that number you rolled. Now, however, tanks have more individual quirks. Some tanks are top laners, some are junglers, some are supports, and their abilities have been retrofitted accordingly. Ramus got his new ultimate, Zack's Q went from just damage to actual crowd control, Nunu's entire kit was changed, Sejuani went from an AoE engage to single target lockdown, Maokai went from a battle tank to an area controller with his new saplings and ultimate, Gragas basically became an AP bruiser instead of a tank, so on and so forth. Depending on who you ask, facing out battle tanks was a good thing for the game. Tanks were arguably the least placed out diverse class back in the day, whereas now, even if there are similarities, they're a lot more unique than they used to be and excel at their own things. However, battle tanks used to have more solo carry potential. Now, unless the tank in question is super overpowered, it feels like you're gambling on your teammates to be reasonably competent. That's why prior to the durability update last year, hardly anyone played tanks and everyone just went damage. It wasn't worth the risk of playing a tank. From a design perspective, I'm happy with the changes, but from a player perspective, I miss old Maokai, I miss Nautilus top, Sejuani used to be my favorite jungler back when a Glacial Prison was a ranged Malphite ultimate. Maybe it's just because I prefer more simple champions, so I might be alone in this, but let me know your thoughts in the comments on whether you're pleased or unhappy with battle tanks being taken out of the game. That's gonna be it for today though, so if you enjoyed the video, it would be great if you left a like and subscribed. Consider following me on Twitter at Vars where I'm joining my Discord server and checking out my other tank videos if you haven't yet. But till next time, thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.